and turning to what I believe is probably one of my favorite psalms, Psalm 127. Psalm 127, if you're using one of the church Bibles, you will find that on page 564, and actually in the top left of that page in the church Bible. I, I believe I've probably preached on every one of the verses and touched on them that are found in this psalm at one time or another, but I do not believe that I've ever walked from verse 1 all the way down through the remainder of the chapter, and I believe that this morning that is the goal for us to do. I said it is a favorite of mine, and I'm thankful that the Lord has steered my heart and uh, my studies for this message this morning to this psalm, Psalm 127. When I see wedding pictures on social media of a couple that had just been married, I will generally tag Psalm 127 along with my congratulatory remarks to them. And whenever I see sonograms posted or pictures of newborn babies online, I will generally quote Psalm 127, and then I will give them my congratulatory remarks after that. Unfortunately, also, when I'm laying awake at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, and I cannot sleep because my brain won't won't slow down and let my body rest, I hear a voice from the past of one brother, Bill Hast, who back in the day used to tell me time and time again, the end of verse 2, he would say that the Lord giveth his beloved sleep. And I don't know what he was insinuating there. I'm pretty sure he was using that out of context. And I'm not sure if he's encouraging me to run to the Lord in order to receive sleep because I was one of his beloved, or if maybe he was insinuating that I must not be part of the beloved because I have sleep problems. I don't know. It was one or the other. But this is a wonderful, wonderful psalm. It is one of only two psalms that are ascribed to Solomon. Psalm 72 is the other one. Although there are some people out there who think that this may have been written by David to Solomon as opposed to being written from Solomon, I firmly believe that this is indeed Solomon's style of writing. This psalm is written in a similar style to that of a proverb. And as you and I know, Solomon wrote many proverbs. In fact, he wrote the book of Proverbs, most of them there anyway. And they also, this also echoes some of, the, some of the tones of the book of Ecclesiastes. And if you search hard enough, you'll find even some, some of the Song of Solomon um, in it as well, some of those tones. Both of those books also were written by, by, by Solomon. But regardless of who you think wrote this and who you think is the author, whether it's David or Solomon, it still remains a terrific psalm composed of only five verses. And the theme of Psalm 127 doesn't change regardless of who wrote it. The theme or what it shows is the the working of the sovereignty of God alongside of the responsibility of man. It's the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. And while that's hard for many people to believe that those two doctrines do not cancel each other out, listen, they are not conflicting, but rather they are cooperative. And and yet we find that in the opening words here in this psalm, that one of these is preeminent over the other. I, I, I bet you you could guess which one is preeminent over it. Of course, it would be the sovereign God. But the first three words tell us, they state this, except the Lord, and that's it right there. Accept the Lord. You, you know, that thought follows through this whole psalm, all of these verses. Accept the Lord or unless the Lord and then fill in the blanks. And so what I want to do is I want to go ahead and read the, all five of these verses in Psalm 127 and then come back and examine them just a piece at a time. And I believe that they flow together. There are people who like to divide this up, but really I think all these verses flow together. And this was the intention of Solomon when he wrote this psalm. So beginning in verse 1, this is what God's word says. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are the children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them, that they shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Now, there are three basic examples that are presented to us in this psalm. 
And they each emphasize the absolute necessity of the blessing and the backing of the Lord for there to be any kind of success in whatever it is that we set out to do. And that doesn't just apply to us, but rather that applies to all of mankind down throughout all of history, both the lost world as well as those of us who are saved alike. The examples that Solomon gives to us here are practical and they are easy for us to understand. They're very common and they're not complex at all. Here's what they are. They are building a house, protecting a city, and producing a family. Those are the three examples that he gives to us to weigh this out, the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man, how these things work together. And, and this is not you know, an, exclu- an, an all-inclusive list. This is just three little things that he pulls out where he says, I see this happening, and most of us can relate to this. The examples, again, are practical. But the truth behind these examples are universal. If God is not in it, then it absolutely is useless for us to work and to labor, to plan and to plot, because we will not prosper if he's not in it. It is just a waste of toil and worry and a bunch of work after work after work, but it will never prosper. And that's the big takeaway for today. If God is not in it, accept the Lord. Friends, just walk away from it because it's a waste. It's vanity. And so in the first example that's found in verse 1, it explains, Psalm explains, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. And the emphasis, by the way, not only in this one, but in all three of these examples, is placed on the Lord doing it, whatever the it is. It's the emphasis that the Lord is doing this first and foremost. And this is the, the, uh, this is the understanding That everything in life, everything that we set our heart to do, every work, every goal, every activity that we hope to accomplish in our life must involve the Lord first and foremost. Because if he's not in it and he's not the one at the top of the list and he's not doing it there uh, ahead of us, then we are wasting our time, we're wasting our efforts, and we are wasting our resources because it won't succeed, it will not last, it will be vain, Scripture says, or vanity. And I don't know if you realize what that means, but, but man, I don't want anything in my life to just be vain. Everything should have purpose. Solomon knew a thing or two about vanity, didn't he? I mean, he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, and in that book he mentions vanity over 30 times. The key verse that sets the scene for all of Ecclesiastes is found in just the second verse of, of the very first chapter where Solomon writes this, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Now you've got to understand the context of that. He's talking about the things that are done under the sun. But this was his idea of, it is all just vain. The idea behind this word vanity or vain is empty or false. It's the idea, or it's, the, it's, some, it's when something gives the false impression That there is something real, something lasting or substantial in it, when in reality, it's all just a lie. It's all just a deception. It's not real at all. It's like a mirage out in a desert. That's the idea of this word vain or vanity. And the picture that the scripture likes to use from time to time is that it's like just a, a wisp of smoke or a vapor. It appears to be so substantial, so tangible in that moment. But then the next moment, it just dissipates and it's gone. That's the idea behind this word vain. And that's what it's like, for example, here in verse 1, when a man sets out to build a house and the Lord is not in it. Except the Lord, or we could say, unless the Lord builds that house, they're laboring in vain. They are wasting their time. I mean, it may look like there's some kind of success there for a while, but I'm promising you this based on scripture. It is vain. It's vanity. It won't last. Either it will crumble or he'll lose it out of his hands, or maybe he won't be able to claim it because he'll be taken from this, this life. Regardless, it is vain if the Lord is not in it. Now, first of all, in this verse, I do want you to take note because we're talking about the sovereignty of God here. But notice there are two builders who are at work in this verse. The Lord is building, that's obvious, but also they, or or we, we're amongst the they, we're the people here, we are also building. This psalm, in the Bible for that matter, does not say, in fact, it never says that we shouldn't labor, 
that we shouldn't work hard to build a house. It doesn't say that we shouldn't draw up plans, that we shouldn't uh, set out to build, or that we shouldn't grab tools and go out there and get to work. I mean, after all, God is sovereign, right? I mean, so whatever he wants to do, he's going to do. And regardless of what I do, it doesn't matter because God's sovereign. He's going to do what he's going to do. Listen, that is poor doctrine. That is not scriptural truth. That is an unhealthy understanding of this all-powerful, omniscient, all, all ever-present God of ours. There are two builders here. The Bible teaches us that we should work. Teaches us that we ought to work. Teaches us that God blesses the work of our hands when our working is in line with his working. Amen? Again, this doctrine, it is of the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man working hand in hand. It's like when the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 10, he wrote these words. He said, but the grace of God, or by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. Paul, at, right out of the gate, makes it abundantly clear. It is only because of the grace of God, it is only because of the Lord that he was who he was, that he was able to do anything that he was ever able to do. It was all God and no glory to Paul. He wanted to make sure that it was all about the Lord and not about Paul the apostle. But then, in a surprising twist, in the very next statement, in fact, in the very same breath, I would say, he writes this, but I labored more abundantly than all of them. Wait a second, I thought you said it was all about the grace, and now you're talking about how you worked, how you labored, and you did so more than everybody else? What are you saying here, Paul? Are you saying that it just didn't fall out of heaven, and all of a sudden you, you, you became an apostle? Are you trying to say that there are certain things that you had to do on your end in order for you to be qualified to be this apostle? Yeah. There were certain things that he had to measure up to and that he had to do within his life in order for him to become apostle. But never, but don't uh, overlook the fact that it was God and only because of God that he was made an apostle. Notice what he says after that. Because he doesn't want to appear to be boasting on himself, but rather only on God. So he immediately follows it up, yet not I. Man, he is confusing me here. I don't know about you. He says, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. This is the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of the man working hand in hand. It's the fool who says, well, I'm just going to sit here and see what God does. Okay? God expects us to act and to work and to do. But he wants us to do it in line with what he's working and acting and doing. Also in 2 Corinthians 6, 1, Paul writes this. We then, as workers together with him, you see, we're, we're in this together. Yes, it is the ministry of God. But it is a ministry that we are in cooperation with him doing. We do it as he does it. You can't just say, well, he's just going to save who he's going to save. No. He chooses us to go out and to get the gospel out to those people who he's going to save. We are a part of the work with God. It isn't that God needs us. Amen? Oh, come on. Can I get a witness? God doesn't need us to fulfill his plan, right? Amen. We need him. It isn't that he needs us, but rather he chooses to use us in his great plan. He chooses to use us. My Calvinist friends, they hate it when I start talking about this stuff. He chooses to use us. Yes, we are the chosen. But here's the deal. He chooses to use those who choose him. Yeah, he chose us before we chose him in the sense that he said, I will choose anyone who will choose me. And therefore, they are meant now the chosen. Isn't that awesome? God will always choose anyone and all people who choose him. You want to be part of the chosen? Choose God. There you are. And so in this sense, he chooses to choose us. It's true in our salvation, and it's true in everything else in our life. The phrase, accept the Lord here, is a conditional statement. Whatever it is that you do, accept that the Lord bless it and back it. Listen, you might as well scrap it. Just mark it off your to-do list because it will be done in vain. It will not matter at all. Choose to do what God is choosing to do. 
Now, up to this point in time, I've been playing along with this analogy, this picture that he's given to us. We've treated this building as if it is a physical, I'm sorry, this, yeah, this, this house as, it is, as if it is a physical building that he is constructing, that he's building here. But the word house could possibly be referring to a household. And so, and so not literally building a house, but rather building a home, a family. There are places in Scripture where this word is used in that way. One of the most common is in 2 Samuel chapter, 2 Samuel chapter 7, where uh, there is a play on words there. If you recall that passage of Scripture, David is sitting there in his house that he has built for himself, and he's looking at the comfort, and he's looking at all the luxury, and he's looking around him, and he's just thanking God, and he's just praising God for all the blessings that God has given in his life. They, he knew that he was just a shepherd boy. He didn't deserve any of this, and now here he is the king of all of Israel. And he's sitting in this wonderful house, and he has in his heart, he sets in his heart that he is going to build God a house. Now that reference is to a physical structure, a little structure. He's referring to the temple that will later be built by his son Solomon. He wants to build God this physical house. But God turns around and he tells Nathan, his prophet, to go tell David, listen, you're not going to build me a house, but uh, here's what's going to happen, buddy. I'm going to build you a house. But he's not talking about a physical house that I already said. He's already in the house. He's talking about a family. He's talking about a lineage when he says, I'm going to build you a house. By the way, Solomon was a part of the fulfillment to that promise. Christ also was in that house. Amen. Jesus in the house, right? But there are many who believe that this is the proper understanding of this psalm. That Solomon is using this house as an analogy for a man's household. But regardless of whether it is a, a literal house or if it's a home with, with a spouse and kids in it, the fact still remains the same. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Can I ask you right now, is the Lord building your house, your household? It's a pretty important question. You know, this also applies even in our next example. The same one, that, or the next one that's given in the same verse here in verse 1. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh, but in vain. Or you could say watches, but in vain. That's what that word is translated more times in our Bibles as, watches. In fact, this is the only time it's translated waketh, but you get the picture here. The idea is that of an, a watchman or a guard who is stationed on top of a city wall and he's keeping watch over the outward fields, looking for any approaching enemies, any threats that would come to the city and its inhabitants. So this is the idea here and this is the picture. He is placed in that position and he's given this task as a means of protection for the city. And this is the point that Solomon is trying to, to, to make to us. It's the idea of protection. This is God's protection that he's now going to start talking about here. Our protection and our security is ultimately dependent upon the Lord. Amen? Yeah, there's five of you. It's not the gun you got on your hip. It's not, you know, your, your, your freedoms and the laws that we have in this country. It's not, you know, your force and your fists. Your ultimate protection is God and God above all. Our protection and our security is ultimately dependent upon the Lord. You know, they could put 10,000 soldiers surrounding the city wall for protection and security to defend it. But you know what? If the Lord doesn't defend that city, it's all in vain. But I don't want you to take this the wrong way. And there's a lot of people who do. This isn't saying that we shouldn't put a watchman stationed on the city wall. And that if we do, then that just shows that we don't trust God for safety. That's not what this is saying. Let me bring it to modern day analogy. This isn't saying that we shouldn't have a military or a missile defense system to protect our, our country from attackers. Right? That's not what this is saying. It's not saying that we shouldn't own or carry a firearm to protect our home and protect our family. It isn't saying that we shouldn't have security systems and alarms in order to aid in the protection, such as what we as a church just all unite, you, you decided on in the past few weeks, you know, to get these security cameras and these new security doors. Listen, that isn't a lack of faith on, God's, uh, on our part for God's secure, uh, protecting and his security for us. Amen? 
God has given us common sense. And God has given us means in which to protect us. And he expects us to use those things. It, it isn't a lapse of faith in God's ability to keep us when we invest in these things for our protection any more than it is a lack of faith when we lock our doors when we walk into the mall over on South Side, right? It's not a lack of faith. That's common sense. Probably a little bit of wisdom there. It's no more lack of faith whenever you lock your doors, whenever you go to bed at night. That's not a lack of faith. That's just common sense. Ultimately, we understand God is our protection. And we can have all those other things in place, but if God decides not to protect us for whatever his reasons are, and let me tell you, he always has reasons for what he does or doesn't do. But if he decides not to protect us, then all those other things will fail. And we understand that. But only a fool would, 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 would have it handed to them and say, well, you know what, I'm just not going to use that. Proverbs 21, 31 tells us this. The horse is prepared against the day of battle but safety is of the Lord. Listen, safety is of the Lord, but that doesn't mean that we aren't expected to prepare the horses and to go out to battle and fight. Amen? This is not a cancellation. The first part's not canceled out by the second one. We understand safety is of the Lord. David wrote in Psalm 20, verse 7, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Amen? But did you know at the same time that he wrote those words, David had many chariots. And many horses that he used under his command to protect the city of Jerusalem and the people of God. Well, that hypocrite. No, it's common sense. In my utter dependence of God for protection, I also realize my calling that he's placed upon me in certain areas of my life to protect. For example, as a husband and father to my family, I am to protect them. As a pastor of this church, I am to protect it and protect you. As a, as a citizen of this country, there are certain things that I'm called to protect. And, and so, listen, there are many other things that can apply to this. But here's something that is far greater. Here's something that's far more that I think we need to consider in all this. If I'm investing so much in the protection of myself and my family from evil men, investing in hours upon hours in self-defense and how to protect myself and my family in that way, investing in stocking up on the guns and the ammo when they're on sale, investing in security and alarms. You know, if I am investing so much in those areas, or how about this? If I'm investing so much uh, uh, against, you know, uh, oh my goodness, investing so much for the protection financially, protect my family financially by, by investing in stocks and bonds and savings accounts and having a retirement account and having, you know, what, what are they pushing now? To invest in gold, invest in metals, whatever it is. If I'm investing so much in those things, all these other areas for the protection of my family and myself, how much am I investing in studying the word of God to protect them spiritually? How much am I investing in teaching them the word of God and showing them the word of God to protect them spiritually? I mean, that's a real question here. That I am to model godly living for them in this ungodly world because who knows how they're going to live if, if I don't show them the example. How much am I investing in bringing them to church and other activities so they can be around like-minded believers and see how it is we're supposed to live in this world? That there are others like them who are striving to be like Christ. How much am I investing in them by protecting our home from the spiritual enemy and him getting in to our living room and his influence being in there on our television set and on our digital devices? How much am I investing in that? See, that's the real question for us here. If I'm investing so much more in all those other areas while only investing this minimal amount in the spiritual protection of my family, then in the end, I want you to understand it will all fail because it's vain. I've chosen the wrong thing. And the same is true for you. You know, it's one thing. If these verses apply, if they're only talking about the work of our hands, our job, our occupation, the protection, you know, of the physical walls, the physical house, all of our possessions. I mean, it's one thing if he's talking about that. If that's really what he meant whenever he said building a house. I mean, yeah, it's a loss if we lose those things. But listen, I want you to understand, it's a whole other ball game if this is indeed talking about our families. It's a whole lot more serious all of a sudden. And I've seen too many families who, who sought to build themselves a home, who, 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 sit, uh, who, who tried to protect their little family, but they did it apart from the Lord. 
They did apart from his way, apart from his methods, apart from what he approved of. And they did apart from the Lord only in the end to lose their children or to lose their spouse. And their house crumbled upon them. It is so vitally important that we protect our family, spiritually speaking, yes, in the way in which God expects us to and has commanded us to in his word. Now, first and foremost, it is trusting God for protection. But then there is another part that we are to do, our responsibility. And that is to model the example. Invest in that word of God. Invest in the people of God. We'll get to it here in a few minutes. About to go off on a soapbox. We don't want that. There is a valuable lesson in this for us. The message to the builder as well as to the watchman who's on the wall. These two characters. No matter how good you are as a laborer, no matter how good you are as a lookout in your work or in your watchfulness, it doesn't matter. No matter how good and efficient you are, if you're doing it apart from God and apart from His ways, then in the end, it will all have been done in vain. Wasted. And in verse 2, he goes on to tell us this. It is vain for you to rise up early to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. This verse is actually referring to those two characters that we just talked about, those two characters in in verse one. It's been taken out of context in so many different ways. Uh, Solomon is not writing against getting up early, and he's not against staying up late. That's not what he's saying here. It's the cause in which they do it. It, It's that in their worry and in their stress and their anxiety, which by the way, that's what the bread of sorrows is, that they're eating. This is why they're staying up late to bring home this bread. And it turns out it's only bread of sorrows. It's, it's anxiety and stress. Since their trust is not ultimately in the Lord for their provision and for the protection, as we've already talked about, it causes these characters to rise up early and to sit up late. It's the idea that, they're, that, they're, that their worry is robbing them of sleep. I think most of us, one way or another, have been in this situation before. Amen? It's miserable. I mean, it's absolutely miserable. You know, oh, I know God is in your hands, but I just can't go to sleep. You just can't turn it over. You can't let loose. It's a miserable state. Imagine that being every single day of your life. These who, who don't trust in the Lord, that he's going to provide for their needs, that he's going to protect them from whatever harm is out there that they're worried about. And, and they are unable to get a good night's rest. You know, sometimes when we do find ourselves there, I don't know about you, but, but I do. I chasten myself. What is wrong with you, Chuck? It, it, it's, it's like the psalmist, you know, oh, oh, my soul, why are you so downtrodden? Why are you being down? What's wrong with you? Trust the Lord. And I can give myself a pep talk. But you know what it's like when you're up and you're wide awake because of an anxious heart, because of stress and worry over something that is beyond your ability to change and out of your control, but yet you're up worrying about it. And you will admit, as well as I will, that staying up, getting up early, and staying up late, and missing our sleep, it did us no good to stress out about it. Right? Did anything good come out of it? No, not one iota. It didn't change anything a bit. It was still there the next day. Still stress, worry, problems. In fact, it was just as Jesus points out in the the Gospel of Matthew, in verse 6, 27, when he asked the question, which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to a stature? And the obvious answer is, None of them can. That that Greek word for taking thought means to be anxious. It's the same word that's used in 1 Peter 5, 7, but there it's translated as the word care. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. In other words, cast your anxiety, cast your stress, cast your worry, whatever it is keeping you up at night, keeping you up late at night, throw it to the Lord. Cast it upon him. He'll carry it for you. It's also the same word in Philippians 4, 6, and 7 where we're told, be careful. In other words, don't be anxious. Don't be stressed out. Don't worry for nothing. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And then the next verse, love it. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Listen, sleep, (laughs) peaceful Calm and rest is a byproduct that only comes from placing faith and trust in God in every circumstance. 
the world doesn't have this. They got their temporary fixes. They got their highs. They got their alcohols. They got their little fixes that they got, whatever it is. Friends, we can, we can give to God. It's like, set it and forget it. It's like, here you go, God. I'm stepping back. What are you going to do here? This peace, this rest can only come, the peace of God can only come to those who, who have learned to fully trust God for protection, for provision, regardless of whatever the situation is. When you come to this understanding about the sovereignty of God, that he has fully in his control every situation and every event that is within his creation, he held, holds it within his hand. Listen, then you can rest. Then you can have the peace of God knowing that he is going to do, what, that he's going to work everything out for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Listen, that is not just something that we just throw around lightly. That is a truth of God's word. But if you don't trust that God is in control of your situation or your circumstances or your sickness or your cancer or, or that person who's trying to sue you or whatever it is that's going on in your life, your unemployment, if you don't think God is sovereignly in control over all that, you're not going to have rest and peace. You think that it's all up on you? Friends, you are, you, you're setting yourself up for failure. It's in God's hands. In other words, you can rest tonight. And every night, for that matter, knowing that whatever's on your mind, whatever's heavy in your heart, is under God's control. Whatever it is, God's got it under control. So this brings us to verse 3. Here we see the family that makes up the home, that lives in this house, that needs God's protection and his provision. You see how that's all connected? Verse 3 tells us, Lo, which means behold, or take notice here. Hey, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. A heritage is something that you inherit. I know this is kind of crazy, it's really deep here, but really it's talking about an inheritance. It's something that's been passed on to you with you specifically in mind for it. So, so think about a literal inheritance from someone who's just passed away and you were somehow in their will, written in their will, and they have written you down that you are to inherit something specific. They have designated that you were the chosen one to receive that inheritance. That's what Solomon is saying the children, that children are. They are a gift, they are a blessing that is passed on to us, parents, from God. We are chosen specifically to get the kids that we get. Oh, man. That's actually a blessing. I can be funny and sarcastic about it all, but really, I think that's a great blessing. For me, anyway. I don't know about you, but for me. We are chosen by God to get the kids that we get. And notice also, not only are they a heritage, but they are also referred to as God's reward. God's reward. And there's a lot that we could say about this, but I decided not to spend all the time on it. What I did want to do is I want to, I want to camp out on this for just a second because these are two different analogies, a, herit a heritage and a reward. Two different analogies, but they apply to all children. Two different analogies that apply or that are concerning children in general. That number one, they are God's gift, right? They're a heritage chosen specifically to whom he gives them to, and number two, they are God's reward. Now, I want you to notice there is no exception. There's no exclusion in this statement. In other words, all children, all children are God's gift and God's reward. All children. Children are not a curse from God. Children are not a punishment from God. Ch listen, children are not a mistake of God. They are a, a, a blessing. They are a heritage. They are a reward to those who God gives them to. They are all a gift and a reward of God. No, not just those that are born with good health. Not just those who are born in a good home. Not, with those, not just those who are born out of a good situation with a, a married man being married to a woman. All babies are. Amen. They are a reward of God and a heritage. They are an example of God's love and his mercy and his blessing to us. Well, by the way, let me just kind of say, because I don't want to get off sounding like I'm saying something I'm not. 
This is not to say that those to whom God has withheld children are any less loved or any less blessed. Remember, God is sovereign. He's over all this. But rather, what it is is in his great omnipotence, and we may not understand it all, but in his great omnipotence, he has chosen other ways to shower his love and his blessings on those people who he doesn't choose to give children to. But it's not a mistake of God. And we've got to understand it is actually for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. It is out of a, an evil, evil, evil heart and a twisted understanding of what this scripture really is saying when somebody tries to use this verse to make the case that this shows that those who are unable to have children are cursed of God. Friends, that is wrong. And that is false. God knows what he's doing. And we may not quite understand it, but he's chosen those people for whatever his reasons are. And we trust him. We may not always like it, but we trust him. So please understand, I am not saying that they are less blessed or that they are less loved. Similar to what we've seen in the previous verses, we saw that it is the Lord who builds. We saw that it is the Lord who protects. And here we see it is the Lord also who gives children. It's the Lord. God doesn't make mistakes again, amen? Never makes mistakes. A man and a woman cannot, between the two of them, produce a child. Wait a second, I see the wheels turning, okay? If God is not in it. They cannot in and of themselves produce a child if God is not in it. There's no way that a child gets into this world and God goes, oops, I didn't see that one. No, no, no. He's the one who gives them to us. God doesn't make mistakes. This is the same, through, same theme all through this psalm. God is sovereignly in control, but there is a responsibility for those on the other end, for us. And so in this instance, God is sovereignly in control of this giving or withholding a child. But for those who desire to have a child, there's a certain responsibility that it's up to them to perform to get the child. But just because they do it, guess what? Doesn't mean they're going to get a child out of it. Only if God gives it. Amen. I think this is so important for us to understand. Except the Lord be in it. They labor in vain who try to produce a child. I don't know how to put that, but it it fits in there somewhere. The Lord has to be the one who gives it. So now I want you to look at verses four and five. Because here's the third analogy for children. They're a heritage. They are are a reward. But now Solomon says, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them, They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. So this is just kind of a breakdown. While we were in verse 3, we saw the children as babies being given by God to these parents through the the womb of the mother. But as you get into verse 4, we'll see this here in a minute, we're in the developmental years here. These are like the young children, teenage years, right before, you know, we're, we're training them, we're, we're getting them ready to get out in the world. But as you get into verse 5, they appear as grown adults. And now they're standing with, in fact, they're standing for their father at the gates of the city, standing in the face of the enemies. I love that. So let's go ahead and we'll break this down. Children are likened to arrows in the hand of a mighty man. That's pretty important. Arrows in my hand don't mean much right? I mean, I might be able to chase after you and jab you with them, but give me a bow. I don't know where it's going to go. But you put them in a trained warrior's hand. All of a sudden, that's a fearsome thing. Amen? That is something to be, to be feared. And the more arrows that he has, the more enemies he can defeat, and the greater impact he will have in the battle. And so this makes perfect sense here. But also, I want you to consider that like arrows, children have to be shaped And children have to be formed, straightened. You know, in Solomon's day, they couldn't just jump into the the vehicle and drive over to Cabela's and and get themselves a compound bow. And uh, I don't know, do they sell them in packs, a pack of arrows? Do you have to buy them alone? I don't know. Should have done the research. Buy a whole bunch of arrows. They couldn't do that. But what they had to do is they would have to go out and they would meticulously choose the sticks and the type of wood that they would want to make their arrows out of. And then they would take them back 
And, they, and they, would, they would whittle them and they would straighten them and they would shape them and they would sharpen those arrows. And then they would attach the fletchlings or the fins or feathers or whatever it is to the arrow so that it would stabilize it whenever they launched it and it would go be straight and true and right to its mark. I mean, there was a lot of thought and there was a lot of work and there was a lot of time put into making and shaping this arrow. Children are like an arrow. It's true of them as well. They need to be shaped. They need to be straightened. When you come out of the womb, friends, you're all twisted and messed up, and so was I. Somebody has to straighten us and sharpen us, form us. This is a full-time job for parents, and I think if you're a parent here, you understand that. It is a full-time job. There's never time off. When we can say, well, you know, I just don't feel like parenting today. Hey, y'all get the day off. You realize that the moment that you do that, that the devil will take advantage of it? And he will move in and take your place? And he will gladly parent your children through the means and the tutelage of the world. I mean, he's, he's hoping that we get tired and we just say, you know what? I'm just locking myself away. Y'all go do what you want to do. He's waiting for that. In the book of Proverbs, Solomon gives all sorts of instructions on how parents are to shape and, and, and mold their children. He, he writes about it's done through teaching, it's done through reminding them, the memorials, it's done through uh, God's law, it's done through discipline, it's done through chastening, it's done through correction. But the most familiar one is Proverbs 22, 6, which states, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. See, that training there, that's up to you, parents. Yeah, that's up to you. It is not the church's responsibility to train your children. Though we would like to come alongside, and we want to help, and we want to guide, and we want to emphasize the training as long as it's biblical, but it is up to you to train your children that God has given you. Amen? It's not the schools. It's not the governments. It's not your parents. You're the parent. It's up to you to train and to raise and to sharpen and, and make sure that that arrow is fit for its purpose and its use. Which brings us to the next thing. Arrows have a purpose. Arrows have a purpose. You better be talking to your children about God's purpose for them. And not just hope, well, I hope they stumble over it and find it one day. Pray about it. Talk about it. Ask them about it. You know, quiz them about it. Well, what about this? What about that? What about that? Where's your heart? Where are you pulled? Where's your talents? Where's your gifts? What do you think God wants you to do? Because they have a purpose. You better be talking also about the target that they're to hit. There's an enemy out there. And that is the target. There's an enemy that they're supposed to destroy the spiritual nature of this enemy and his influence in their life and the lives of people around them. They're, they're an arrow that destroys that. You better be talking to your children about that. Don't say, well, no, that's the people of the church. That's their job. That's what the pastor does. That's what Brother Greg does. Well, that's what the one teachers do. That's what those Bible thumpers do. No, that's what we all do as children of God. We are to go out. We are to pierce the enemy as an arrow shot through its heart. Arrows have a purpose. And parents, if you do not take the time and make the effort to shape and straighten and aim and launch your arrows at the enemy, I promise you this, the enemy will take your arrows and he will pick them up and shape them himself and he will turn them around and fire them back at you. And we see this happening all the time today. And I'm not talking about it in the world. We see it in the church even. This is exactly what's happening. It's what's taking place in our society. Parents who have checked out. They've done enough. Or maybe they, they, they're, well, they're cool and they're trendy and they're, well, they're all the cool parents there. And, and they say, well, I just don't want to force you know, my, my personal views on my children and have them growing up hating me and despising me because of it. They're going to hate or despise you for something else then. What do you mean you don't want to pour? That's why you have those views. That's why you have those standards. That's why you have those values. Because you think they're true and they're right. What do you mean you don't want to force them on your children? What kind of hate is that? Instead, what do they do? They let Netflix, Disney, things like YouTube parent their children. And they'll tell them what their purpose is in this life or lack of purpose is. They'll tell them what to look like. They'll tell them how to behave. They'll tell them how to live and how to think. And then the parents wonder when their kids turn on them in regards to their way of life, their traditional marriage, 
their Christian values. They scratch their head and say, well, how on earth did this happen? I'll tell you how it happened. The enemy got to them, picked up the arrows, shaped them, and now he's firing them back at you. That's what happened. Parents, it is your responsibility. This is not a game we're playing here. And I know I'm kind of getting off on tangent. I told you I'm getting on the soapbox this morning. All you over here, you're like, I got great grandchildren. What do you mean? Hey, relate to your kids and their kids. So they do it in their kids' life. Like, great, great. Yeah, that's how it works. It is Bible truth. But I want you to notice verse 5. For those who view children as arrows, who shape them according to their purpose, look at this again. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Did you notice it went from singular, the man, to now there's a they going to the gate, and they who are speaking to the enemies? There's an old uh, German proverb that says this, many children make many prayers, and many prayers bring much blessing. I think there is a benefit to having many children. I just do. But I'm not about to sit here and say that this right here tells you you ought to have many children. I think that's taking this out of context. And I think it's a, a mis- I think it's abuse of Scripture. I don't think anyone can say for certain how much a quiver is full of children. What is a full quiver? I mean, there's been a lot of research, a lot of studies, a lot of time wasted trying to figure out what it is, and they, it's all over the charts. I don't think anyone can say for certain how much is a, is a full quiver when it comes to children. I think, based upon what we studied already in this 127th Psalm here, that, 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 that the, the idea behind it is that only God, the sovereign God, can determine the amount of children that your personal quiver can hold. Amen? Amen. That makes sense to me. The result here, verse 5, of having these children, raising them, training them, is that they shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. It seems like I've gone over this last four weeks over and over again, but the gate of the city. The gate of the city is a place of business. It's a place of commerce. It's a place where justice was served. The place of city politics is where all the men gathered together. It's where they talked about the town business. It's where people would come in the city and people would go out the city and they had to get permission to come in and sell and they'd have to, you know, go out and check out and check out and make sure, you know, that everything was, was kosher and everything was done the right way. And this was the gate. This is what was going on there. And the imagery here is that this father is now in his elderly years. And, and he may have made some enemies along the way, evil men is basically what this means, evil men who want to do him harm. Maybe they don't like his godly lifestyle. Maybe they don't like his godly business. Maybe they don't like that God continues to bless him and they're not getting blessed. Whatever it is, there are enemies at the gate. And this father, in his elderly years, goes to the gate and these men would like to take advantage of him, either, either through business deals, kind of pull the wool over his eyes, or, or maybe perhaps uh, maybe through falsely accusing him of doing wrong of some sort. But after a, laf- a lifetime of investing in his children, after a lifetime, a lifetime of, of shaping them and, and forming them and sharpening them and getting them prepared, he's invested in them and raised them to be honorable and godly and, 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 and valiant and full of character and full of integrity. This man now goes together and they, they go together to the gate. They are there with their father to speak on his behalf. They are there to protect him from those enemies who'd want to take advantage of him. They are there to deflect the attacks of those evil men and to defend their family. This is the benefit here. They are going to the gate with their father. And this father can trust his children to take care of him and to take care of their mother. But don't mistake this as to this man putting his trust in his children and relying upon them. No, 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 no. But rather, they're, they are merely just a gesture of God's love and his gift to him. Listen, it is God who this man has put his trust in. It is God who has proven through his life that he's relied upon God. All those years when he was raising his kids after the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, he was putting his trust and reliance on God. Not in his own ways. Not in his own wisdom. 
He was trusting the Lord that he would keep his promises. He's trusting the Lord by obeying God's commandments to train them up in the way that they should go. And now this is the fruit of it. This is the benefit of it. This is the payoff. I, I read uh, where someone wrote a couple weeks ago. They said, your greatest contribution to this world may not be something that you do, but someone you raise. That's awesome. But it's only the grace of God. The only way that's going to happen is by you obeying God and trusting him and relying upon him and following after his, his law, keeping his commandments, living a godly life, walking after Christ. Listen, I don't want to live my whole life having spent all my days and all my time and all my talents and all my efforts and all, all my finances only to find out that it was all done in vain. That it was a waste. Apart from God, all of our human efforts are useless. I don't want to end my life and realize, man, I was relying upon me. I wasn't relying upon the Lord. I was relying upon what I could do, not what he could do. Apart from God, all of our human efforts are useless. Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it. Can you honestly say today that you're completely relying on what the Lord desires to build in your life and in your home? That you're not out chasing your own building projects, spinning your wheels, losing sleep, not relying on God's blessings he's already given you, his provision, his protection. Listen, listen, if that is you, Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What about you? Do you see God's provision? Do you see God's protection? Do you see God's blessings? That word happy, happy is the man. It means blessed. Do you see it in your lives? Are you falling after Christ?